Hey everybody, again, so good to be with you today, and I'm really excited as we dive into this journey through many of the Psalms uh, this summer as we engage together. Today, we're actually going to start in Psalm 16. Uh, some weeks, we're going to just take all of one Psalm at a time, but throughout the month of June, we're going to kind of methodically walk our way through some parts of Psalm 16. So if you've got a Bible, I want to invite you to turn there, grab that. I think this is going to be a really great series to just grab a Bible and circle and underline and maybe take some notes in your Bible. And so when you refer back to them in weeks or even years ahead, we'll just be encouraged again by some of the life and truth we're going to encounter in this psalm. Here's part of why I think Psalm 16 is so fitting to us right now. Well, we mentioned before that the Psalms have all of the ranges of emotions, right? I mean, the Psalms are full of lament, but also full of great celebration and triumph. The, the Psalms are, are full of agony and despair and yet great victory. The, the Psalms are, are full of reflection and also full of great declaration. I mean, they're loaded. The Psalms cover all, really all, of the experiences and the emotions of life we have. But in Psalm 16, we find really a psalm of confidence, like of assurance, of, of just a bolstered strength. And I think right now, in this time period that we're living in, it's, it's helpful for us to be reminded of the confidence we can have in our relationship with God and our walk with God, both our connection to God and our walk with God. And the psalmist in Psalm 16 really writes out of that, writes out of that confidence. But in the writing, we get all this revelation about how to experience that confidence, how to experience a confidence and assuredness from and in our connection to God, but then also a confidence and assurance as we walk in the world with God. So I'm real, again, I'm so full of anticipation of what the Lord's going to want to do in our hearts individually and as families and as a collection of people through the month of June as we navigate this psalm, Psalm 16 together. So I want to begin just by reading the psalm in its entirety to us. It's not a very long psalm, but I just want to read it to us and then we'll go back and we'll just land in some of the beginning parts this morning as we launch into this psalm of great confidence. Psalm 16, here's what the psalmist most likely David wrote. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, and apart from you I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they're the noble ones, in whom is, shall be your delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot or my life secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, and surely I delight in the inheritance that you've given me. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. And even at night, my heart instructs me. I can't wait to talk about that in a few weeks. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence and with eternal pleasures at your right hand. I mean, you even start to hear it just a little bit on one reading. Do you hear some of the confidence of of David in this, just this confidence in his attachment to God and in who God is and how God shapes his life and helps him walk through life. I mean, it's just loaded with this, this anchor of assurance. For our time together this morning, I want to wander back just to verse 1. And I actually want to share with you that verse in a slightly different translation of the Bible. It's a little more accurate translation. Instead of it saying, you know, keep me safe for I take refuge in you, it in the ESV version of the Bible, we, we read the word preserve. Preserve me, O God. Preserve me, O God. For I do take refuge in you. Preserve me because I, I take my refuge in you. This, this word preserve is fascinating to me. And a few months ago, it really struck me, just grabbed a hold of me. And, and then even a few weeks ago, I was reading back through it again. And just it was medicine to my life in the moment. Let me tell you what the Hebrew word for preserve is. It's kind of a fun word because it's an easy Hebrew word to say. It's shamar, shamar. In fact, just maybe say it to yourself or say it to whoever you're sitting with or whatever, just shamar. And there it is, you're speaking Hebrew this morning, shamar. It means to, to preserve. And, and here's what's true about things that we preserve, right? We preserve what we see as valuable. 
you and I preserve what we see as valuable and what we see as gaining value. We preserve what we see as valuable and what we actually see as the, having the potential to gain value. When, when I was a kid, uh, as you know, I've talked about this all the time, I loved sports, I still love sports, I loved baseball. And one of the things I love to do is I love collecting baseball cards. And I would uh, get baseball cards and I would put them in these plastic sheets to, to protect them or to preserve them because I would go to the card shop with, with a friend or with my stepdad, Bill, or he would take me to a card show in, in a mall or in a high school gymnasium. And, and I would buy these cards and they were so valuable to me. And I actually believe that in some respect they would gain in value. And for a while they did. Not so much anymore, but for a while they did. And so I'd want to protect them and I would preserve them. And I, this, even just feeling today, these sheets, these are still some of the cards that I collected and kept over the years. And some of these actually were my, my stepdad bills when he was a kid. And I have them now in these sheets. And I still just, the, even the feeling, it just takes me back into my childhood and the smell of this plastic. I, I remember it and the feel of baseball cards. And I can remember places that I sat and opened them in my room or in our living room or in a friend's living room and the experience of picking out the ones I really wanted to preserve and putting them in the sheets, right? And then sometimes that, that wasn't really enough. And what I would do is then I would put the sheet inside an enormous binder, right? And so this binder is full of those sheets of just all of these different baseball cards that I I wanted to preserve and protect because to me they were valuable and I, I've still got a lot of these sheets and a lot of these binders just kept and, and protected and they're in our basement and they're they're up off the floor in case our water uh, water ever came into our basement right I mean it's because I wanted to preserve them to me they had value and I thought they could have long-term value and in many ways they do they, they don't have long-term financial value but again it's a significant memory of my childhood, of just a lot of what I did growing up was, was around earning money to buy cards and then buying cards and then protecting cards and then trading cards and then selling cards and still have thousands of them. It's just, it was one thing I wanted to preserve. And we all had those things as kids, right? I mean, we all had something we wanted to preserve, right? And in fact, maybe just in your comments section today there, why, wherever you're watching this, just in the feed, just why don't, you, why don't you just type in something you wanted to preserve as a kid, or maybe if you're watching with your family in the living room or some friends, or you've invited some neighbors over, just real quick, just share, as a kid, what was something you wanted to preserve? Maybe it was your time or your free time. Maybe it was a, a certain type of collection or dolls of stuffed animals or, or cards or some, uh, um, cars or some other collectible thing. Or even my daughter Mackenzie, she was always catching animals when she was younger and she wanted to preserve them as long as she could, keep them alive as long as she could because she th knew they had value as a living creature and then she wanted them to add value to her, something she could take care of and treat well, right? So she wanted to preserve them. We all have those things, right? These things that as kids we want to preserve. And we still have them, right? The, the things that we want to preserve change a little bit over time. But you and I, even today, we have some things that we want to preserve. We view them as valuable and we view them as potentially still growing in value. Here's what's fascinating about the word preserve in Psalm 16 to me, though. And here's what so ministered to my soul a few weeks ago was this reality that, that God wants to preserve you. And God wants to preserve me. This reality that in the, in the hardest of times and in the greatest of times, David is connected to a God he knows wants to preserve him. You and I can be connected in relational intimacy with a God that, that is capable and willing, desiring to preserve us. To, that, which means this, which means which means God sees you as valuable, which means God sees you with growing potential to be more and more like him, more and more shaped in his image, more and more displaying his glory and his love in the world. God wants to preserve you. God wants to preserve his love in you. God wants to preserve your awareness of him. God wants to preserve things like the fruit that we label the fruit of the spirit in the New Testament of the Bible. God wants to preserve in you those things like love and your joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and long suffering, the ability to endure. God sees you as valuable. God wants to preserve you. Isn't, isn't that fascinating? I mean, listen, it, it means this. 
that when we encounter this God who wants to preserve, this God of Shamar, what we realize is that God isn't just barely saving us. God isn't just barely getting us through something. God isn't just barely getting us through. God is preserving us because he sees us as valuable and sees the, the long-term value of us, sees the continued growth in our lives, the continued transformation in our lives. And so God looks at us and says, oh yeah, man, David had it right. I want to shamar you. I want to preserve you. And maybe today, again, regardless of what you're in, no matter how good or how bad life feels for you right now, maybe there are some things that God would just want to say, oh, man, I want to preserve you. I want to preserve that in you. I want to preserve you and I want to preserve that in you. And it's just encouraging. Like, for, I, I just hope that's a breath of fresh air. Like God doesn't just want to barely save you. God wants to preserve what you are and what you can be. Shamar, the God of all creation preserving you. But it's, it's also interesting to note that we have a part, right? I, I mean, keep me safe or preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you, right? Remember that the psalmist said that? I take refuge in you. I make a move to you. But what's, what's the move? I mean, like, how do we actually take refuge in God? I mean, if God's the one who preserves us, like, how do we get under his covering? How do we get our life into the places that, that we experience his refuge, his preservation? How do we experience where he gets us to the place of refuge so that he can refuel us and recharge us and heal us and, and re-envision us and reignite us and, right, preserve that and grow that peace and preserve and grow that joy and that love? How do we get to those places? Well, there's a, there's a few things, and, and even inside of some of this, this Hebrew dynamic that David is, is writing out of and, and really writing this reflection of his own confidence in God, we see some of that. Here, here's the first thing, to, to understand God is the one who preserves, the God who would shamar us, to preserve us. One of the first things we got to do is, is see the danger. Like in order to, to get, take advantage of the rescue, you got to see the danger, Right? In, in order to, to take advantage of, of the fact that there is a refuge, we have to acknowledge there even is a need for a refuge. We, we've got to see the danger. Right? We've got to see the danger. When, when the storm is coming, or, or the, the, the thunderstorm, or the lightning storm, or the tornado is coming, we've got to acknowledge the danger and get to the refuge. But there's no impetus to get to the refuge if we don't acknowledge the danger. So let's just talk about it for a second and what God would want to preserve in us. And we talk a lot about this around journey. I mean, we're three parts, right? We're a body, soul, and a spirit. We're a physical body that, that houses our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, the things we think and our motivations, and our spirit, which when we give our lives to Jesus, that spirit is literally born again, brought from death to life. And it's the part of us that will live forever somewhere, right? Body, soul, and spirit. And and the Bible is honest enough, the story of God throughout Scripture is honest enough to say there is danger to all three of those in this world in which we live, right? And so maybe even today you'd say, what's the danger to my body? Maybe you're wrestling sickness. Maybe you're fighting off disease. Maybe you're, you're wrestling through just not feeling well. Maybe it's something as simple as allergies right now. Can I get a witness, somebody? I mean, right? Maybe it's just as simple as you can't walk out the door without your eyes, water, nose, right? Right? It's like, okay, there, there is a body, right? And we understand that it's, it's fallible and it's, it's de decaying and declining, right? And one day this body will pass away. And yet while we're in it, while we're in it, God says, look, I want to preserve you. I don't want you to experience temptation through your body. I don't want you to have to sin with your body or through your body. I want to preserve you. And then there's our soul, our emotions and our feelings and our motivations and, it's, and the way we think. And God's saying, look, I want to preserve that. I want to preserve it because it's valuable. I want to keep on preserving it. The writer of James said that it's through the, actually the scriptures that God keeps on saving our soul, keeps on transforming our mind, our will, and emotions, right? And, and, and sometimes there's, we, we get hurt or we get wounded, or we get disappointed, or we just have the setback of a dream not realized or something that didn't happen or the way we thought God might move. And, and God in the middle of that says, look, take refuge in me because I want to preserve you. I want to preserve your soul so I can heal you. That can rebuild you. What's the, what's the thing that's pushing against your soul today? And might it be that God would want to preserve you so that he could guide you through? And then, and then there's just our spirit, right? This part connected with God. And we know there's a very real enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy our lives. And that stealing, killing, and destroying is it has an impact on our body, soul, and spirit. But even this, even this spirit side of us, this part of us united with God, called to life in Jesus, 
but tempted to, to live like we don't need Jesus, tempted to live like God is holding out on us, tempted to, to live apart from him. God says, wait, when, when it gets really hard and that's the temptation, I, I want to preserve you. When life is so good that you're tempted to think you, you don't need me or I'm not engaged, I, I want to preserve you. Sometimes we just got to acknowledge the danger. What's your danger today? I mean, do, what's the danger? Is it a physical thing you're struggling with? Is it an emotional soul or mind thing that you're struggling with? Is it, is it a spiritual thing? And is it some combination of all three of those? Even just in the last 12 weeks while we've been in this whole deal, I've, I've wrestled in all three of those departments of my life. And yet here's the God of all creation saying, yeah, but John, yeah, but friends, I, I want to preserve you. So see the danger. See what you're really up against. See what you're really up against. See the danger. See the danger. But, but then the question is not just to see the danger. It's, it's also this thing of, okay, then, we, then we, once we see the danger, we need to see the need. See, a lot of times we see the danger and we think, okay, I can go do that. I can take care of that. I, I see the danger. I got it. I'll take care of it. I know my way through. I don't, I don't need the Lord. That, I'm not going to bother the Lord with my small things. I, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to take care of this, right? Or I deserve this. I did something wrong and I'm, now I'm going to navigate it. And yet that's not what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, for I do take refuge in you, which is really seeing the need. It's seeing the need for help. It's acknowledging I, I can't get through the danger on my own. I wasn't created to make it through the danger on my own. That's why there is a God who wants to shamar, to preserve us, right? Because we got we to gotta somewhere see the need. Now, now here's what's interesting. The, the story of God painted in the scriptures um, is, is a God that's, that created us to be with him, which, which means we're created to, to, to need him, to rely on him, to function best with him. Nowhere throughout the scriptures do you see the story of rugged individualism. You understand? Like there's nowhere in the scriptures where we, where we read the story of rugged individualism. I know that's something like we super value in our part of the world, but, but, it's, but it's not valued anywhere in scriptures. Like reliance is valued in scriptures. Reliance on God and life together, that's what's valued in, in the scriptures. And that would have been the picture that David writing in, in Hebrew words and with Hebrew imagery and Hebrew thought in his mind would have been, would have been leaning into this, this reality that, wait a second, I see the danger, but when I see the danger, I also see the need. I need to, I'm going to need help. I, so, and so, Lord, preserve me because I do take refuge in you. I see the danger and I see my need for refuge. Okay. What, what's interesting is that would have been counter all the other gods in the ancient time who would have said, figure it out, like figure it out and get to me, figure out your way to me, figure this thing out on your own, make yourself good enough to deserve me. It's just completely opposite the God of the scriptures, completely opposite of the method and the mode and the motive of Jesus coming to rescue us, right? It means Jesus screaming, you have a need and I'm here to meet it. It's one thing to see the danger. It's another thing to see the need. One of the most freeing things that a lot of us could do today, one of the most courageous things a lot of us could do today is just look in the direction of God and say, God, I just want to say again, I need you. I, God, I need you. God, my, my mere acknowledgement, I need you. You preserve me, and I'm just acknowledging that there is danger all around. And, and there's a lot of things trying to steal, kill, and destroy my life. God, I need you. I see the danger. And I also, like, I see the need. I see that I need you. And then the thing just becomes to say, okay, now that I see the danger and I, I see the need, I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to look for the Lord's presence everywhere in my life. I'm going to look for the Lord's presence everywhere and in every second of my life. When I'm in my home and I'm by myself, I'm just going to be aware of what is the Lord doing? How is the Lord enjoying this time with me? How is the Lord inviting me to enjoy this time with him as I wash the dishes or I mow the lawn or I put my kids to bed or I try and figure out tomorrow? How is the Lord with me when I'm with my family and we're maybe sitting down for dinner or we're talking about the plan for tomorrow or we're playing a game or we're having a disagreement or a discussion? How is the Lord with us? I will seek the Lord in every time. When I'm driving somewhere and I'm wondering how in the world I'm going to make it on time or what am I really going to or am I really going to do this again? I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to be aware of his presence and what he might be doing. It's so much of what Gabe talked to us about last week and what a right now word that was for Gabe, from Gabe. 
that we can sometimes be so close to God and yet miss him, kind of like cross the paths with him in the hallway and miss him. It's one thing to see the, the danger and see the need, but then there's this element of just to seek the Lord. I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to seek to be aware of him in every capacity of my life, in every moment. Be, because listen, because the God who preserves is the God who is always with me. The God who preserves is the God who is always with me. But listen, part of what preserves these, these baseball cards for me is that they're always in the plastic. They're always in the sheet. Part of what re- preserves the sheet is that they are always in the binder. They're always in this, right? We are always in the presence of God. The question is not the presence of God. The question is our awareness of the presence of God. So David says, man, part of why I'm so confident is because the Lord does preserve me and I take refuge in him. I see the danger all around me, but I acknowledge my need and I just seek the Lord everywhere I am. I seek the Lord when I'm being attacked by enemies. I seek the Lord in times of peace. I seek the Lord when nothing's going my way. I seek the Lord when everything is going my way. I I just seek the Lord. I'm aware of his presence. Right now, wherever you're sitting, the Lord's with you. Right now, whatever you're thinking about you're going to do this afternoon or or this evening or tomorrow or next week, I just want you to know the Lord's going to be with you. The Lord's going to be with me. The Lord's going to be with us. Could we look at him and say, God, yeah, I see the danger. It's a real thing. But but I'm also just going to to see my need for you and be aware of your presence. God, preserve me because, because when I see the danger and I see the need and I seek your presence, I really am just taking refuge in you, God. I am taking refuge in you, God. God, thank you that you would have such a deep desire to shamar me, to, to preserve me. I mean, let me ask you two, two questions. Just as we wrestle with this psalm that could, could stir some confidence in our connection to God and our walk with God and in a very broken, hurting world right now. Let me just ask you two questions. Here's, here's the first one. Just where do you, just, just your own life, where do you need the Lord to preserve you? Where do you need the Lord to preserve you? Do you need the Lord just preserve your energy in the workplace because you're, you're still trying to figure out new solutions and new ways or, or gain customers back or reconnect with customers or f- figure out how you're going to work with colleagues? or Maybe you just need the, the Lord to preserve you in endurance and energy wisdom and stamina. Do, do you need the Lord to preserve something in your family? Is there something to just say, God, maybe even it's good right now. It's, it's good. It's great. I, I want you to preserve it because I see the long-term value. One of the things I, I think about often is just the Lord preserving my family because it is good. And I love my wife. I love my girls. And I think, man, you know what? 20 years from now, it could be better. Somehow with, with a limitless God, it could somehow be better. I don't, I don't know how. But God, oh God, preserve us. I see the danger. I see all the things that would want to pick us apart. God, I, I see the need that we need you. The four Allens, we, we need you to lead us. We need you to keep us together. So God, I'm looking for your presence everywhere. Do you need the, do you need the God who preserves just to preserve a, a friendship or a relationship? Do you need him to preserve something financially? Do you need him to preserve just a calm and a peace? Do you need him to preserve a joy? What, what is it? We need the Lord to preserve today. To just be the God of the Shamar. Let me ask you a second question, though. I think it's just an important question for us right now. Certainly we want to ask, like, okay, God, just in my own life, where do I want you to preserve something? But the second question would, would, would be for all of us. Who is the Lord inviting you to help him preserve? Who is the Lord inviting you to help him preserve? You see, so often the way God preserves is he uses us. He, he uses us to be part of his preservation for others. He uses us to be part of the encouragement for others. He uses us. I can't count the number of times I've seen it in these days. Even, even this morning, even this morning, the time I'm recording this, even this morning, I got a text from a friend that was just part of the Lord preserving my soul. He didn't know how to text. We haven't talked in several weeks. And it was just part of the Lord preserving my soul. He's using somebody else that I have a relationship with to be a part of preserving my soul. I look back and I wonder over the last few weeks, God, where, where have you used me to be a part of preserving others? Where, God, are you inviting us right now to 
be a part of your preserving work and others. You're preserving, protecting work because you see value in people and you see the long-term potential value of people in your good ongoing work and you carrying out good works that you've begun in us. We live in a world certainly right now, right, where we want to continue to acknowledge the value of all people. We want to stand with people who are hurting and who are oppressed and who are beaten down and pushed back. We want to, we want to stand with people in all issues on lots of sides and say, look, boy, what a, what a challenging world and how many things we're learning and, and trying to understand and how we're trying to be good listeners. And right, Lord, what's my place in that? How would you invite me? to be part of what you're doing to preserve people. God, what's my part? God, how are you inviting me to be part of your work to preserve people who don't look like me and who may not have historically been part of my normal day-to-day -day interactions or my circles of influence? God, how are you inviting me? How are you inviting me to be part of what you're doing to preserve others? See, that's the, that's the thing. I mean, it, it takes an action, right? It's a choice, right? I, ma I made a choice to get the cards into the plastic. I made a choice to go get the plastic and get the cards so I could put the cards in the plastic. I made a choice to get the binder that I could put all the sheets of plastic in, right? It's a, when we engage in what the Lord is doing to preserve the people around us, it's also a choice for us to say, God, here I am. I see the danger to me and the danger to the world, and I need you for me, and, I need, and we need you for the world. God, here's what I need you to preserve in me, but, but who are you inviting me to help you preserve? Just with those two questions in front of us, here's, here's the thing. I, I want to pray for us in just a minute, but, but do you see how it's the beginning of this confidence that David's really writing about, I think? When we, when we start from this perspective that, that God is preserving us, that God desires to preserve us, and that's why he's willing to be a refuge, it just reminds us of how God sees us as valuable. We are valuable to him. He has set the value by choosing us. Humanity is valuable to God, and he has set the value by creating and in choosing humanity. And there's a confidence that comes with knowing that and, and not questioning, not wavering on it. But by saying, I, you know what, I'm preserved by the God of all creation because the God of all creation created me and values me. Let it be the beginning, anchor of your soul as we navigate this psalm together. Where do you need the Lord to preserve something in you? Who is the Lord inviting you to be a part of his preserving work. Let me pray for us and then just share a couple other things with us. Lord Jesus, thanks for this psalm. I'm so grateful for a psalm that's loaded with confidence. I'm so grateful for David and his, his candor in so many places in the psalms, including this one, that just really is anchored in this depth of connection and with you and the strength that comes from that. And I'm praying that today, Holy Spirit, you would encourage us and that you would challenge us in a way that you do that's encouraging and inspiring. That seems to be how you always do it. And that you would lay a really good foundation of, of how, you, how much you value us, how you choose us, how you love us, how you preserve us. Lay a really good foundation on us even this morning that, that will prepare our hearts for everything else you want to share with us in this psalm. Help us see who you want us to be a part of your preserving work. Where are you and who are you inviting us to? To be a part of your preserving work in them. We trust your leading in that. Thank you for your undying love. We really do continue to give ourselves to you in Jesus' name.